Welcome to Study with the Best, the magazine show that's all about CUNY. I'm Tina Beth Pina. On today's episode, the costume collection at Queens College, a virtual reality lab at Lehman, innovative fiber art at Queensborough Community College, and so much more. But first, fiber art focuses on the materials and the manual labor of an artist, and CUNY showcased 24 Taiwanese artists at Queensborough Community College. The exhibition Rewoven Innovative Fiber Art is an exhibition of 24 artists from Taiwan as well as um, artists who are based in New York City. It was a three-part exhibition. One part was at the Godwin Turnbach Museum at Queens College. The other was at Queensborough Community College Art Gallery. And then the final uh, was here at Museo de los Soros. Fur, bamboo, wrapping bags, thread and wire. These materials are transformed into paintings, sculptures, and installations that represent contemporary forms of fiber art. Some of the materials that the artist used in the exhibition were such as Pen Ping Yu was using felt material to make the rice cake tower of happiness that was cloth and felt and fabric material used to create a tall sculpture of New Year's rice cake like objects that were brightly decorated as well as her table piece which used felt to create food like forms of different kinds of objects like dumplings and vegetables and and all of those were placed on handmade paper plates and bowls which were, were very beautiful and delicately crafted. Huai Huai Su used beauty product face masks that she dyed and then sculpted them into forms and then used a hardener on them too so that they would hold the form which they were in. So she made a very large um, flower piece that hung on the walls as well as flowers that sat, stood on the floor where it had reflective mirror bases and so they were like blooming flowers. The weavings of thread express the perspectives from the artist's life and the changes that are taking place around the world. Using their own cultural background, the artists incorporate the environment, nature, and social issues as main themes in the exhibition. For example, Ming Jiuquo tackled overdevelopment issues in his piece, Suburban Housing. It's a plastic and transparent pieces that the, he, uh, the artist also dyed and put a little pattern onto that the acetate, a clear plastic piece, and hang it from the ceiling and put it into a different way. It looks like a, a, a city jungle in there. But if you careful, looks the uh, individual detail that you will see that actually is a community housing. It's been developed, overdeveloped, very crowded situation, like the shape of that the installations. After viewing some of the pieces about the environment, you might find yourself looking at a series about individuality. In faux fur, the artist cut synthetic fur in order to mirror a three-dimensional landscape. The sign Touch Me, hanging next to the painting, invites the audience to touch the art. Touching the surface changes the color and texture of the piece, thus projecting different scenery with each stroke, allowing for a theme of individuality. As you enter the center of the gallery, you'll encounter what was perhaps the most astonishing piece in the exhibition. The piece is called Between Dreams. The artwork and directly, of course, nostalgia. Artist Kalun Lulu N. She uh, grew up from the indigenous in the East Coast in Taiwan. But the very interesting that she chose the uh, recycled material that from the supermarket that um, wrapped the fruit. And the entire piece creates a completely pure white, directed to talking about very serious issue of that uh, environmental uh, harmful to the native land, especially in her tribe. The exhibition received positive feedback after it was opened to the public. Student and faculty really appreciated the exhibition. They were very interested in the subject matter as well as the process and technique of creating each art object. And so we had lots of visitors from studio art classes, history classes, English department classes who could use the exhibition 
for their courses in many different ways and just have great discussion in the gallery based on you know, what was being presented and the topics that were presented in the exhibition. These artists weave a world of creativity as a form of expression to redefine what fiber art is and emphasize the harmony and conflict between human life and the natural world. Up next, Hunter sociology professor Margaret Chin examines a documentary, Excuse My Gangsta Ways, the latest film to be featured on CUNY TV's web series, Short Docs. And when my dad did actually leave, things in the house just wasn't the same no more. My mom was very bitter, but she was very angry and she didn't know how to express her feelings. There was no one around to do that. So she basically blamed it on me. Usually she's like, oh, you did this, you made your father leave, blah, 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 blah. I can't believe you did this. Like, just all these nonsense accusations that you couldn't make sense of back then, but you felt mad hurt because suddenly, like, your world turned upside down. Like, why I'm being attacked. It was, like, a lot of verbal abuse, but then became physical. And when it started becoming physical, that's when I was like, you know what, F I'm going to leave. And I wasn't, like, leaving, leaving. I was, like, running away, coming back, running away, coming back. Well, I think girls and boys um, uh, are attracted to, um, you know, wanting to feel like they belong, right? So I think that's with um, any individual. So when you look at any uh, teenager, they want to belong somewhere. And if they feel like they don't belong at home, or they feel like they're not um, uh, belonging even at school, they're looking for a place. Now, usually gangs are violent. And girls tend not to be attracted to uh, violent places, but um, it doesn't mean that they're not. And so for some, maybe that's the first place, or maybe it could be um, a girl, a gang that's majority girls, uh, where they feel like they can be accepted for who they are, and where they can feel like they can actually talk to others about their dreams. So in her case, it was really interesting that she talks about the other girl that got killed. They actually shared a dream of upward mobility, right? They shared they wanted to be able to um, earn enough money to move to the Upper East Side and leave the gang. And I think in, for other people, the other gang member who probably had, um, who maybe came from the same background, could actually share that dream with her, and that's who she related to. And I think that's one of the reasons why she was attracted to that group. I actually believe that, um, that because Asian Americans are always seen as the model minority, um, and in fact, I think a lot of Asian Americans are unwilling to talk about uh, when there's divorce in families or when there's hardship in families, that some of the kids slip through because they're not willing to acknowledge it. So one way is that if you acknowledge it, then the schools would be more accepting of programs, or even the police might be more accepting of programs, or community centers may be more accepting of programs to recognize when there's distress in a family, including Asian American families, and for people to kind of um, see those outlets. So there's a role for everybody, community members, um, people elderly in the community who even see her walking around in the community. There's roles for everybody uh, to play to keep um, young people safe. I actually think there's a lot that could be done. I mean, she obviously, she talks about going in and out of juvie, right? So she's been into the prison, I guess, the young, the young prison complex. And so it hasn't rehabilitated her by going in and out. Um, it might be reinforcing. So part of what we could do is reform our prison system, reform what we actually believe young people are able to do, because it is a huge cost. The, the, the group that she's talking about 
almost all of them, except for a few of them, are gone, are dead, um, or on drugs, or, or whatever you want to mention. So it has to start from some place where you re can recognize that part of it, is, it wasn't her fault, but a lot of it is, you know, when immigrants come here, they work long hours. And it's not just immigrant communities, many communities, people work long, long hours and aren't able to spend times with their children, you know, and make sure they grow and they have schools, maybe sometimes automatically um, see a kid do something wrong, they don't get a second chance. Um, so all these different things are going on. Um, so I think we have to look again at the opportunities we offer to young people to make sure they feel like they can actually attain those opportunities. I think it'll make a huge, huge difference. To learn more about this documentary or the Short Doc series, visit our website at cuny.tv. Bet you didn't know that Queens College has a costume collection filled with 19th century gowns, hats, and corsets, just to name a few. The collection exists due to the dedicated faculty preserving it. Touching the garments and seeing them with their vibrant colors and how striking some of these garments really are, you really get a feel for the time. This collection offers students this rare material culture experience. They can come in and experience uh, garments uh, with all their five senses. In a textbook you see the beauty of it, but when you really can take this opportunity to look at them and study them so closely, you connect to the garments. As Charles Baudelaire said, fashion is both ephemeral and eternal and functions as poetry and history. And that's why it's incredibly profound to me, but it allows students to open up their experience of fashion design and understand the profundity of it. That pink dress is one of my favorites, like from the 1950s, it's, it's wonderful. This is a Couture Yves Saint Laurent evening wear dress. This is Oscar de la Renta cocktail dress. This is Molly Stone for Sex Fifth Avenue. This is attributed to Maggie Ruff, so it's late 20s, early 30s. And this is a circa 1917 World War I era day dress. a wonderful selection of shoes and many uh, from the 1930s but a particular uh, favorite pair of mine um, are these from the 1940s and in the in the 1940s during World War II there were restrictions on leather and silk silk for parachute and leather of course for belts and boots um, and glycerin as well so these are actually made out of wood and uh, the, the uppers are, uh, and the ties are made out of rayon, which was the silk substitute at the time. The collection was begun in the 1950s by Professor Irene Bush, and she put it together as a study collection for the students in the fashion program here at Queens College. And there was an initial uh, sizable donation from the Brooklyn Museum and subsequently we had gifts from the Metropolitan Museum of Art and other uh, New York families donated accessories and garments and outerwear to the collection. We are working on an HVAC system which we don't have and revamping the storage. When I inherited the collection and adopted it. We've been replacing non-archival materials and uh, been working very hard on rehousing. And we're open to any kind of donations and we need donations. Day after day, I find things that just astonish me, like a very special, um, you know, streamlined hat from World War I or this beautiful 1930s sequin gown. And I just love it. And I love the research and the ability to offer it to my students. It's a rare resource. The 
parks have become some of New York City's crown jewels, but who maintains them? City College professor John Krinsky explains. The first big reduction in the city's workforce in parks came in the fiscal crisis in the 1970s. There are roughly half the number of maintenance and operation workers in the parks as there were prior to the fiscal crisis. You have private organizations like the Madison Square Park Conservancy, but really first like the Central Park Conservancy that started to replace the public workforce with its own private employees. You have Madison Square Park Conservancy, you have the Bryant Park Corporation, which also has its own private workforce. There's a private workforce in Prospect, the Prospect Park Alliance, but that has a mixed workforce, and that's, that's a model that's been used uh, in a number of different conservancies. One issue has been the replacement of civil service employees with the private park conservancy workers. But another one has been the displacement of these regular workers with all manner of other workers that do the work for a lot less money or for free. So first you had Workfare. Then that program started to get scaled back, but the job training program took its place. Now you have people who are sentenced to community service. You have the displacement of these city workers who have rights and who have usually higher levels of pay and benefits at the same time that these parks are creating not just value for the public that enjoys them, but privately accumulated value, in, especially in the form of either commercial activity like the Shake Shack, which is right behind you, or um, real estate values. So you have, for example, behind the camera, two enormous new buildings designed by international star architects. If you combine that, this private value provided by parks, with the lowering of the labor standards that are maintaining those parks, that seems to me to be a really, really problematic um, set of, or, or state of affairs. To the extent that these private conservancies are responsible for raising the money themselves to maintain the parks, they're going to often change the concessions in the park. So in Bryant Park, for example, the concessions have become steadily more expensive. And it sends a message to parks users about who this park is really for, or who the, the whole enjoyment of this public space is really for. So of course, you can be dirt poor and sit on a chair in Bryant Park and nobody will disturb you. But you cannot enjoy the, all of the park's amenities. If you have enough money for a hot dog, you still can't because there's not the hot dog vendor. Then that's been reproduced particularly in, Midtown, in the Midtown Park. So the string that goes from Bryant Park to Madison Square to Union Square, actually down to um, uh, Washington Square. Well, that's part of the reason that we wrote the book, is that you don't see the labor stuff. If you go to the New York section of bookstores, one of the things that you'll often find are these beautiful picture books about Central Park, about the High Line. And there are these pristine pictures of places that take a lot to maintain, and you never see the people maintaining them. Even in Central Park, where if you actually visit it, you, there are these ubiquitous little golf carts that the Central Park Conservancy workers ride and they do everything with. You never see those in the pictures. And so, one of the things that we are interested in as sociologists is looking at these things that you don't see, or you don't, re you may see it, but you don't register. But I think we also have to re rethink the way that we do public services in a way that is more accountable publicly and more accountable to the people who do the work, because 
we've really moved away from that. And uh, I think to the de our detriment as a, as a society. The city has announced a new virtual reality lab at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and Lehman College's very own VR lab will play a vital role in it. Okay, we're at the building. We're going in. Oh, we're getting a heat signature from the first floor. Yep, we've got it. We found someone. We've got a flash over at level three, guys. Uh, Lehman College is very much committed to expanding access to careers of the future. And so through a public-private partnership agreement with Eon Reality, which is one of the world's premier uh, virtual reality and augmented reality companies, we decided that it was uh, a good time to try to put together a virtual reality uh, training academy and development lab for Bronx students. Um, the idea being that we could uh, prepare uh, students for this new and exciting world of tech and do so in a way that would ensure the quality that uh, Lehman uh, students are, are accustomed to receiving. Hey Sam, do you think we can have these three outlets done by tomorrow? The program is open not only to CUNY or Lehman students, but also to Bronx residents in general and people from the surrounding communities. The cost for CUNY students is $499 um, for an 11-month training program. The first three months will be focused on the theory behind augmented reality and virtual reality, and the following eight months will be focused on actual development of uh, solutions based on this technology. Um, and there will be an entrepreneurial type of component to that as well to ensure that the projects that the students are working on are projects that will be uh, beneficial uh, in general uh, to the world. Uh, students that participate in this 11-month uh, training will work on animation, uh, 3D graphics, and web development, among other technologies. I'm a doctoral lecturer here at um, Lehman College in the Middle and High School Science Education Department. I also teach in the biology department. I'm interested in taking the training course because virtual reality has a lot of good implications with respect to education and specifically science education. Hello and welcome to this new anatomy lesson about the heart. Let's start with a bit of background. A lot of times science concepts are really difficult for students to understand because sometimes these concepts are very, very abstract in nature. So it's very hard for students to be able to understand things that they cannot see. And this new virtual reality technology will be able to give the students the ability to be able to do that, to be able to conceptualize science in a way that they're not currently able to do. Lehman College is very excited about the prospect of using uh, this uh, initiative that we have to not only educate people that will be able to enter the field, but also to do so in a way that will allow them to create applications that we can bring back into our own classrooms. An area of particular interest is in nursing. Can we develop applications that we can bring into our nursing program so our nurse practitioners will be able to, in a virtual, safe environment, uh, put into practice some of the things that they're learning in the classroom. When we look at where we stand with respect to the services we provide to the Bronx community and surrounding regions, we realize that the only way that we can continue to be a vehicle of upward mobility is if we provide access to the careers of the future. And those that provide an upper uh, middle class uh, shot at uh, upward mobility. As an engineer and as president of Lehman College, I'm really proud that we have a lead in this area. That's our show for today. For more information on any of our stories, log on to our website at cuny.tv or check out our Study with the Best Facebook page. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye.